This is a quick introduction to the project management framework, that body of ideas and concepts that you need to understand in order to learn how to use and apply the different tools and techniques and processes that are part of what we think of as traditional project management. Now, this is a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. The first thing you need to understand is that the point of learning something is transformation, to go from being one kind of person to another, in other words, to enhance our capabilities. Typically when people are learning project management, they're starting out as implementers, people who know how to do something, they know how to follow direction uh, in order to accomplish something. The idea is to become a project manager, someone who can lead the process, not just follow it. Now this course is intended to help you manage projects professionally, and what do we mean by professionally? Well, we're going to talk about that over the next few minutes. The most important thing is to have a purpose. When you're learning project management, for me, my area of interest is in the creative side. How do we ensure that the things that we create are as creative and innovative as, and innovative as possible? Good project management means we have more room, more adaptability for implementing more innovative, newer, better ideas. That's why it's interesting to me. Now there's a lot of different flavors of project management, but often people think of them as breaking down into two big areas, traditional or agile. Traditional is what we think of when we think of the Project Management Institute, or PMI. Uh, they have a framework that's been around for a long time. Uh, it's what is used to test people when they want to certify as PMPs, or Project Management Professionals. That's what my own training is in. Um, but there's also Agile, which is a more contemporary uh, framework that is used uh, quite often inside of software development, sometimes inside of the game field, but it can really be used for almost anything. Both are extremely valuable. Neither is you know, better than the other by any stretch. Traditional isn't exactly hidebound in any way. In other words, traditional can be very flexible too. And I've seen some people use Agile in a very rigid way. So either can work in the context that we want to use it in. But we're going to focus on traditional, that body of techniques that has been around for a while that is the core of really knowing your project management uh, discipline. Now the problem we deal with with projects is uncertainty. Because there are so many different factors that we don't control, they all become like dice. In other words, when you start a project, you're kind of rolling the dice. We don't know where everything's going to fall out, and that creates a lot of uncertainty. And so that, if you think about it, you have all these problems when you undertake a project. How big can I make it with what I know how to do? How long is every part of this going to take? What's good enough for this project to be something that really lives uh, for a long time in my portfolio, for example? How much time can I afford to put into this? What kinds of things might go wrong? All of these pieces of uncertainty create risk for us. What project management does is it helps us manage the uncertainty. It helps us tame it because we know how to deal with it. Now learning project management is a lot harder than it should be. And I'm going to tell you one of the secrets as to why it is actually quite difficult for most people. It has to do with the fact that almost all the terms and ideas that we use are things we talk about in day-to-day -day life. But in day-to-day -day life, all these different terms like scope or goals or objectives or constraints we use them in very ambiguous ways. They mean sort of almost anything you want them to mean. But in project management, in the discipline of project management, every one of these has a very specific meaning. And it's specific because we have a certain way of using it that makes sense. Think about even terms like goals and objectives. These get used interchangeably in day-to-day -day conversations, but in project management they mean specific things. You're going to learn all of these concepts. There were over 30 on that slide. You're going to learn all of them today. This is a little infographic that I include with this uh, lecture. It's a diagram of some of the core ideas in the framework. And what I want you to do is if you can download it um, and ideally print it out, is as you learn each concept as I discuss them in this little lecture, uh, I want you to just check off in those check boxes when you feel like you've got it, when you feel like you've understood it. That way when you get to the end, if you're trying to figure out do I understand the project management framework, all you have to do is see if there's parts of this that you haven't checked off, parts that you really didn't understand, and then you can go back and review those or look them up online. So that's what I created that for. Okay, so let's start with the two big ideas, goals and objectives. So what are goals? Well, a goal might be I want to be rich, that's a perfectly valid goal, or I want to be famous, or I want to end world hunger, or I want to have the top vampire movie in Canada. These are all goals. They're very generalized. They're uh, ideals, they're the way we'd like the world to be. They're beyond our control. You can't force everyone to go see your vampire movie. You can't forcibly end world hunger. So a goal is really a desired state of affairs. It's how we'd like the world to be. Um, if you think about your project, how will the world change if everything goes perfectly on your project? 
Will you suddenly get a job? Will you suddenly have a, a successful film? Will you suddenly have a successful game? What's the goal of your project? Now, if we take an example goal, we might take something like, take Jane Smith, who's a candidate for the Senate in California, and we say our goal of this project is to get Jane Smith elected to the Senate. Now, we can't force people to vote for Jane Smith, so that's why we can dif differentiate this as being a goal. It's a desired state of affairs. It's what we're hoping to happen if everything goes well. Um, another goal might be reduce the adoption of smoking in North American teenagers. We know that we can't force them to stop uh, uh, taking on smoking, but that could be the goal of a project. The goal would be to get them to stop uh, taking on smoking. Uh, another goal might be to get people over 60 to reduce their impact on global warming. A lot of people over 60 don't really buy into global warming very much. Hard to get them to want to reduce their carbon uh, footprint. So sometimes, uh, as you may know, uh, goals get written out in a bit more detail in what's referred to as a vision statement. And a vision statement is a way of really elaborating how will the world be if our company is as successful as we want it to be, or our organization, or whatever else. But this is what we think of as a goal. So when you first came to VFS, you probably had uh, goals that you wanted to achieve inside the program that you're taking. And this is a good time to ask yourself that question. What was my goal? Even if you didn't set one then, you probably have a goal that you've had for a while. Uh, and it's good to sort of force yourself to address those. What is my goal? Why am I here? Why am I doing this? Now, the next concept we have to deal with is objectives. Now, for a lot of people, people think objectives are the same as goals. And it's true that in conversation, people use these terms interchangeably but they're not the same inside of the project management framework. Objectives are quite different. Remember that we said that goals were general, they were ideals, and they're beyond our control. Well, objectives are very specific. They're not just specific, they're also measurable. In other words, we have to be able to measure uh, whether we have achieved them or not. They also have to be achievable in the sense that they can't just be ideals. They're not just things we're hoping will happen. They're things we absolutely intend to have happen, and we can reasonably expect they will happen if we do our job properly. But there's actually more to this. Objectives are also relevant to our goal. In other words, they help us get from where we are to a place that is closer to our desired state of affairs. And then finally, they're time bound. In other words, whereas the goal, I want to be rich, doesn't, mean, doesn't tell you when you're going to be rich, an objective would have to specify, are we talking about six months, six years, how's that going to work? So objectives are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, and that's what we mean when you hear the phrase SMART objectives, S-M-A-R-T. So let's try this with a couple of objectives based on the goals we said earlier. So remember we said we wanted to get Jane Smith elected to the Senate, and we know that we can't force people to vote for, but we could set an objective of this project to increase Jane Smith's name recognition in California by 50% over the course of the next six months. Name recognition means if you ask a person, a voter, uh, have you heard of Jane Smith, they would say, yes, I have. They would know who that was. So that's our objective. Well, let's test it out. So is it specific? Yes, because we're talking about increasing her name recognition. We know exactly what that means. Is it measurable? Yes, we could poll Californians to test it. With an objective, it doesn't mean we have to measure it, but it means that we could measure it. Um, is it achievable? Yes, we know that if we take out newspaper ads and television ads, we can get Jane known. Is it relevant? Is it going to help her get elected? Yes, uh, we know for a fact that when people know who you are, you're more likely to get elected. Is it time-bound? Yes, we specify during the next six months. Let's try it again. What about an objective to get five major newspapers to publish stories about the connection between smoking and cellulite over the next 90 days? So is this a good objective? Well, it's specific. We're saying five newspapers to publish stories about cellulite. Um, is it measurable? Yes, because we can see how many papers wrote the stories. Is it achievable? Yes, we know that if we do enough press releases, some newspapers are going to actually uh, write the story. Is it relevant? It is, because for teenagers, the idea of cellulite is often scarier than the idea of death. It sounds terrible, but it's true. And is it time-bound? Yes, because we specified over the next 90 days. Let's try one more. Our objective by May 15th is to create a simple way for people over 60 to measure their carbon footprint. So is this specific? Yes, we're saying people over 60 should be able to measure, see their carbon footprint. So that's specific enough. Is it measurable? Yes, we could do tests of subjects over 60. We could put together a focus group or of 10, 20 people, put them in front and ask if they found it easy to do. Is it achievable? Yes, we know that with some good interactive design, we can do this. Is it relevant? Yes, it's relevant because if people see their impact, it's got a better chance of getting them to change their behavior. And is it time-bound? Yes, we specified by May 15th. Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. 
So set some objectives for yourself for this term or this period in your life. It's good to write down one to three objectives. Specific, what do you want to have happen? How are you going to know if it's happened? Are you likely to accomplish it? Does it actually further your overall goals for your life? And when will it be finished? So it's a good practice to do uh, even just in your own life, but in the case of projects, it's absolutely critical. It's critical to be able to define objectives, and it is much harder than people think. When you sit down with a client and you realize that they're talking in generalities and you have to kind of pin them down to specific objectives, that can take quite a bit of work, and that's part of what makes project management a challenging but a valuable discipline. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about that discipline. I, I tend to refer to uh, project management as a noble art, and I'm going to explain why that is. Um, the first thing is to understand what project management is. You have to understand the difference between a project and a process. These two things are very different. A project is a unique temporary endeavor. So there's three words, unique, temporary, and endeavor. So what does a unique mean? It means it's not something you do repeatedly. It's something you do once, and you, you're not going to do the same thing again. There's always going to be something different. It's temporary because it's done over a fixed period of time, and it's an endeavor. The word endeavor means work intended to produce change. So a project is something that you do uh, one time over a fixed period of time that's intended to produce some change. That's what a project is. Now, a project is not a process. Remember what we said a project was? Well, a process is actually a way of doing things. That's what a process means. In other words, a process is not unique because processes have to be repeatable. So when you think about a scientific process, the test is always, can you repeat the experiment and have the same results? So it's not like a project. And it's not temporary because sometimes processes are ongoing. Like having a good diet is not something you just do temporarily, you do it forever. So that's the difference between projects and processes. So ask yourself this question. If you make a birthday cake for the first time, is it a project? Well, the answer is yes, because it's unique. You haven't done this before. You haven't made this particular cake before. Um, it's You're doing it over a fixed period of time, and you're doing it for a reason. You're trying to actually create something. You want to start with a bunch of ingredients and end up with a cake. So, But what about the, the question of, let's say, a website? People usually think of websites as projects, and they are. But what if a company makes websites every day, and they do it the exact same way every single time. In other words, they just use templates. Is that a project? Well, no, because if you do everything the exact same way every time, it's a process. In other words, that same birthday cake we talked about, if you're someone making a birthday cake for the first time, or even just a new kind of birthday cake, then it's a project. But if you're a bakery that just makes these same birthday cakes 500 times a week, it becomes a process. So that's the difference. The discipline of project management, though, uses processes. It has dozens of processes that you use to help manage your projects. So who really decides what kinds of projects we take on? Who gets to decide what these unique temporary endeavors are that we undertake? Well, stakeholders. And you have to understand stakeholders to understand the project management framework, because they play a critical role. Who are stakeholders? Well, they're people. I encourage you to always think of stakeholders as people, because people are the ones that make decisions. What kind of people? Well, the people that have influence over the project. So what does that influence mean? It means that they have some power over what we're trying to do. That means they can help us or they can hurt us. So stakeholders have influence over the project. But they can also be a different kind of person. They can be people who are simply affected by the project. So people who are affected by the project means that what we do might help them or hurt them. So stakeholders are people who have influence over the project or are affected by the project. That's what stakeholders are. Now there's three key steps in doing stakeholder analysis. Three steps that we like to do to do a decent stakeholder analysis. The first is just identify the stakeholders. So who are they? So for example, let's say we were going to do a new shopping mall development. Stakeholders would certainly include the client, but they'd also include the people that are investing in the client's business. They'd also include our team. After all, we're very affected by it, and in fact, we have a lot of influence over it. Other stores in the area are also stakeholders because our new shopping mall might help their business or it might hurt their business. But so are the people who have kids and live near the mall. They're stakeholders as well because what we do affects them. So the second thing we have to do is identify their stake in the project. In other words, what specifically is this person's stake in our project? So let's take the parents just as an example. Well, there's increased traffic when you make a new mall and that can pose a risk to their kids because of all the cars. If it's a well-designed mall, it might actually be very convenient for the parents because it might help them do family errands. 
But if the mall attracts the wrong kind of stores, like arcades or stores that sell porn or knives or weapons, it can also have a negative influence on the kids. So that's their stake in it. So now the third part of stakeholder analysis, and a lot of people don't do this, which is what makes a lot of projects fall apart, is you have to think about what are we going to do for this stakeholder. In other words, how are we going to deal with their stake in the project? Let's take the parents again. What could we do to acknowledge their stake? Well, we could ensure the entrances to the mall are on multiple streets so that we reduce traffic congestion. The more entrances, the less density of traffic we're going to have in any one place. That reduces the risk of cars hitting people. We could also consult with parents in the community about their needs and concerns, find out what kinds of stores they're likely to frequent and things like that. That's also going to make our mall so more successful. Finally, we could also consider putting all non-kid friendly stores in the upper level of the mall and having a security located there. I always wonder why malls don't do this anyway. If you think about it, don't you want to put all the stores where you don't want little kids going in, in one area of the mall? It makes life much easier to run it. So if you think about it, one of the most important things about stakeholder analysis is that it often helps us make better decisions for the mall. Uh, or for the, whatever the project is. In this case, if you look at these three examples, all three of these things are probably actually going to help the business that we're trying to create. So that's why stakeholder analysis is important. Okay, you try it. If you say that VFS is a stakeholder in your project, you have to answer the two questions. What is Vancouver Film School's stake in your project? Is it simply that if you make a great project, it's going to make the school look good? That could be fine. Or is it something else, like your project's going to take up resources, which uh, in, uh, prevents a school from taking on other projects or things like that? And then what are you realistically going to do about it? I say realistically because, I mean, you can't do everything for everybody. Even when someone's a stakeholder, it doesn't mean you're going to completely turn your project upside down for them. You have to think about what can we do. So just as a simple example, if you're making a film, well, Vancouver Film School's stake in it is if it's a great film, they want their logo on it. Um, and we can actually put the uh, title slate Vancouver Film School presents on it and the end slate at the end. Um, it's those kind of simple things that help your project go a lot smooth, um, more uh, smoothly than if you don't think about who your stakeholders are and what you're going to do. Okay, so it's good on any project, perform a stakeholder analysis. List the stakeholders. Who are they? What's their stake in the project? In other words, how do they influence it and how are they affected by it? And then what actions do we need to take for this particular stakeholder? Always try to put these in order of priority. Don't just have a list of 25 stakeholders because, frankly, it becomes unusable. Better that you have five stakeholders in order of priority so we know who is most affected or most influential down to the least. Stakeholders always have a lot to gain or lose. In other words, they're the ones that are often taking the most risk. So who do they turn to when they're starting a project? Uh, for example, a client wants to start a project and they're afraid of all this uncertainty, all the things that can go wrong. Well, they turn to the noble project manager. And I say noble for a reason, and you'll understand in a minute. I think most people have a very skewed notion of project management. They tend to think it's somebody who walks around with uh, you know, a clipboard making notes and just kind of yelling at people. Um, they think of a project manager as someone who's non-creative, who's focused only on numbers and on nagging people, who wants everything done the same way and likes to write reports. That's not what a good project manager is like. A good project manager has to be a little bit more like a, you know, someone that you would entrust your future to. Somebody more like a, a sort of a knight, if you will. Someone who's creative, someone who's really good at leading people, someone who's a great communicator, who can adapt to each challenge, and someone who likes to win victories. And this sounds a little strange to people, but it's true. You need a project manager who really wants to win. Not because they want to beat people, they want the project to be a big success. Those are the qualities that we look for in a good project manager. So ask yourself, what was the last person you worked for like? Were they like the numbers and nagging person or were they like the sort of the knight that's out there really trying to succeed for all the stakeholders? Now, why do people hire project managers? So specifically, what are we hiring them to do? What's our expectation of a project manager? Three big things, I think. First, protect the project objectives. In other words, they are there to ensure that whatever else happens, those project objectives that we set get met. Second, they have to be people who are who are completely fearless in the face of uncertainty. In other words, they have to help, help us predict how things are going to go even when there's things we're not certain about. So they have to be able to make estimates even when we don't know all of the answers. And third, they have to be able to communicate with all the key players. Communication is a big part of the job. So if all of this sounds so good, then why do so many people actually hate project managers? A lot of creative people actually really dislike project managers. And that's because the people they've encountered 
tend to be the ones that nag people about irrelevant things, don't want to understand the creative process, they want to force everyone to do it their way, and they generally want to take the fun out of the work. So if these are qualities that you find yourself uh, exhibiting in your own practice, then you're really losing the plot of being a good project manager. Successful project managers are always focused on the big picture, the project objectives. They understand how creative, uh, creative process works and they know how to apply creativity. They help people see the value in what they're being asked to do. They help find innovative solutions when the usual steps won't work. And fundamentally, they make you glad you worked on the project with them. That's a really important part of being a project manager, otherwise you never get hired again. So what are the project manager's duties and expertise? Duties, like what things are we, do we expect them to do, and expertise, what things do we expect them to know? Well, there's five basic duties of a project manager. We, we get them to initiate projects in phases. We get them to plan the best way to accomplish the objectives. We get them to execute the strategy. We get them to monitor and control the project on a day-to-day -day basis. And we get them to close the project successfully at the end. Now, these are called the process groups. And you have to learn them. You're going to have to always know what are the five process groups. Initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, and controlling, and finally closing projects. So what are the areas of expertise? In other words, what are the things a project manager is supposed to be an expert in? There are nine of them. Scope, time, cost, communication, human resources, risk, quality, procurement, and integration. And these are called the nine knowledge areas. And you really need to know these as well. We're going to talk about them more in a little bit. So what qualities should a project manager have? In other words, what kind of attitudes and, and characteristics do we look for in a project manager? Well, for me, there are really three. First is communication. Project managers spend 80 to 90% of their time communicating. In other words, you don't get to go off into a tiny room by yourself and ignore everybody. You're going to spend most of your time talking to people, writing to people, just communicating to people because that's a big part of the job. Second, leadership. We need project managers to get people excited about working together to achieve the project goals. In other words, getting everyone aligned with the same vision. And finally, ingenuity. You often have to find solutions to unusual problems as a project manager. Those are the three characteristics. Now trying to put all this together makes for a noble art indeed. In other words, it's a lot of work. So how are you supposed to do this? How do you get from where you are there? Well, I would recommend you do three things. Apply the processes you learn in this class. In other words, when you learn a technique, actually try to apply the technique. Don't just evolve or revert to whatever you used to do before. Actually make an effort to apply each process you learn. Second, communicate when you're not sure. In other words, if you don't know the answer to something, you're not sure how to go, go out there and talk to someone with some experience and see what they would do. And finally, don't be afraid to think your way through the problems. Just because there's a big problem in front of you, it doesn't mean you can't come up with the answer. Chances are you're the best positioned person to devise a solution. Okay, so what do, what, let's talk about the discipline of project management. So I mean, what is the sort of the formal way we think of project management? Well, there is a definition you can use. And the definition of project management is the discipline of planning, organizing, and managing resources to bring about the successful completion of specific project goals and objectives. Well, that's terrible. That's a very blah sort of uh, answer. So what's wrong with it? Well, it doesn't help me really think about project management. And that's a problem because the point of a definition is to help you think about a subject. So, you know, what's wrong with definitions? Um, well, the problem is they never actually help us think about things. So let's take an example of love. Can you have a definition of love? Well, actually, you can. The definition of love is simple. It's a deep, tender, ineffable feeling of affection and solicitude toward a person, such as that arising from kinship, recognition of attractive qualities, or a sense of underlying, uh, underlying oneness. That's the definition of love. And it sucks. It's accurate, technically, uh, but it still sucks. So why does it suck? Well, it sucks because it doesn't help me think about love. And more importantly, it doesn't make me any better at the practice of love. So what do people use to help them be better at the practice of love? Well, they use the Kama Sutra as a good example. Now, it's not just about sex. The Kama Sutra is really a body of techniques that helps people be successful at the art of love, if you will, at all different aspects of that. I know it sounds funny, but this is the best example I can come up with. Um, well, project management is the same thing. Project management is a body of techniques. That's what it is. It's just a bunch of techniques. Where do they come from? They come from a lot of different disciplines. Project management steals from everywhere. It steals from management theory, from sociology, from psychology. It steals from history. Anybody that's got a good idea of project managers will steal it. 
The idea is to take a body of techniques that help you be successful at running projects. So that's what it is. So that makes for a simple definition. Think of project management as a body of techniques you use to be successful at running projects. Now, there's a caution here, though. Just as with the Kama Sutra, would you use every single technique all the time just because you knew it? That would make for a fairly unhappy partner. So what you do is you use the techniques when they're appropriate. So that gives us our first rule, really. You'd never use the same colors in every design or the same techniques every time you make love, so you shouldn't manage every project the same way. You've got to actually recognize that all projects, by definition, are unique. They have different clients, different resources, different problems they're trying to solve, different constraints. So the first rule, the way you manage the project must match the needs of the project. So that's how you should think um, about the idea of using tools. That's what we do. We find tools and we use them. Um, we draw them from many different, different dif disciplines um, with, the, in, with a mind to being more successful in our projects. And that's how you should think about project management. So try it out for yourself. Ask yourself, what is a project? If you're having trouble remembering, we said it was a unique temporary endeavor. There's really only three words you need in order to think about what a project is. And how should we think about project management? Think of it as a body of techniques drawn from lots of different disciplines to help us be successful at running our projects. Okay, this is usually a good time if you want to sort of pause this and take a 10 minute break because it's been a lot of information, but I'm happy to keep going on. So the next thing we want to talk about is the project management framework. This is the hard part. So remember I said there are five process groups. You really need to remember this. You should be able to quiz yourself any day of the week and go, what are the five process groups of the project management framework? Those are initiating, in other words, selecting which project should we choose. That's what initiating is really about. Planning, what's the best way to pursue it? Executing, being able to ensure that everyone follows the plan. Controlling the project, checking to make sure everything's going according to what we want, uh, expect it to. And then closing, making sure we get everything we can out of the project once it's complete. Those are the five process groups, initiating, planning, executing, controlling, and closing. This is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Each process group interacts with each other in a logical fashion. So let me explain it to you like this. We start by initiating the project. Once we've selected the correct project, we then come up with the plan. Once we have a plan, we start the process of executing the project. While we're executing the project, we uh, control it. In other words, we check to make sure things are working right, we make adjustments as we go, and then we go back to executing it, and we go through the cycle of execution and control at the same time. So we're always doing the work of the project and checking to make sure everything's going right. Sometimes we hit a point where we realize things are not going right, and that means we have to go back to planning again. So we replan, and then we go back to executing and controlling until we, and asking ourselves, okay, are we done yet? And eventually we're done, and that's when we close the project. This diagram is a very common diagram you see in a lot of project management books, and it reflects the way that the different process groups interact with each other. Initiating, planning, executing, controlling, and closing. Now these five process groups, they represent the kinds of activities the project managers are responsible for. So ask yourself the question, do give yourself a little test, what are the five process groups and what does each one mean? If you're having trouble, just go back and take a look. You have to know, initiating, planning, executing, controlling, and closing. That's what we do. Now, there are nine knowledge areas. We talked about this briefly before. Again, this is important. You have to really know it. These are the nine things that project managers are supposed to know better than the other people on a project. So the nine knowledge areas are scope. In other words, what is the stuff that needs to be done? Time. When are we going to do it? Cost. How do we pay for it? Human resources. Who are the people? What are they going to do? Quality. How do we make sure that the work that we're doing is worth the effort? Risk, how do we deal with unforeseen events? Communication, who needs to know what, when, and how? Procurement, how do we get the things we need? And finally, integration, how do we put it all together? So integration is really about how do you balance all those other things? That's the biggest, most complex part of project management. Balancing quality and risk and scope and time and cost and all of these different factors. So these knowledge areas you really need to know. Um, they're the, the specific areas that project managers oversee. In other words, if you're taking on a web project and you're the project manager, you don't need to know how to program websites. You don't even need to know much about design, but you do need to know about those nine knowledge areas. 
So try to remember them. And just as a hint, I'm going to give you these um, nine uh, images to look at. Um, don't look at the infographic for this. Just try to see if you can come up with them. And so if you look at these images, you can sort of figure it out. On the top left, that's really scope. It's the way all the work that needs to be done. That clock represents time. On the right, you see the beautiful bottle of wine pouring into a glass. You can think of that as quality. Um, on the middle left, you see there that's bro that glass breaking, that's risk. Uh, how all those puzzle pieces are going to fit together, that's integration. On the right, the shopping cart. Where are we going to get the things we need? That's procurement. On the bottom left, the money, we can think of cost. Those telephone booths are a good way of representing uh, communication. And then follow finally, all the people that we're trying to get hold of. The, that's human resources. So this is just an image just to help you kind of have a chance to think your way through it. Okay, so what happens if we take those five process groups we talked about them and multiply them by the nine knowledge areas? What do we get? Well, we get this big giant table. Every tool used in project management, every process that we learn, actually fits in this basic table. It sounds very strange, but it's true. Basically, 90% of what we know fits in there. Now, I haven't filled it in because that would take forever and be very tiny text. But what I want you to understand is almost every process you learn, every technique you learn in project management, is one of the five is in one of the five process groups and one of the nine knowledge areas. So the whole discipline of project management, in a sense, can almost fit inside of a big table. So it's just a way of thinking about it that helps you understand that we do have, even though this is a big discipline, a big field, we can actually think of it as kind of a set of specific techniques. Remember we said before, it's a body of techniques. And this is kind of how we think of that body of techniques. All right. These five process groups in the nine knowledge areas, that's what you actually manage. When we say man project management, that's what you're going to manage. So now we need to think a little bit about the project life cycle. So what's a life cycle? Well, people have a life cycle. You have, you're born, you're an infant, you go through adolescence, adulthood, old age, and finally death. That's the life cycle of a person. So projects have a life cycle too. A movie, for example, has pre-production, production, post-production, post distribution. So it has a life cycle just as a person does. Now a, proje a project's life cycle is made up of phases. So what's a phase? A phase is just a period of time during which related activities take place. So when you're going through a phase as a kid, you're going through certain types of activities that are all associated with being of a certain age. Well, it's true in projects as well. So if, if you think about the infancy phase of a person, what, what's happening? What are the activities there? Well, things like learning to walk, learning to speak, burping, pooping, and crying a lot, right? Well, if you think about the activities during the pre-production phase of a movie, there's related activities as well. Getting a script, casting actors, setting a budget, and often crying a lot too. So different types of projects have different life cycles and therefore different phases. So for example, on a website, we might have a different set of phases than on a movie. Our phases uh, in the life cycle of a website might be the discovery phase, the definition phase, the design phase, the development phase, and then the deployment phase. The type of project determines its life cycle and therefore determines its phases. So we have to figure out what is the life cycle of this particular kind of project we're taking on. So think about the last project you were involved in. What were the phases? Whether it was running an event or building a website or writing a book or any of those things, you probably went through phases. In each phase, we create deliverables. So it's important to understand what a deliverable is. We have to have a common language for it. A deliverable is a tangible result of work. Tangible means you can touch it. Tangible, in this case, really means, though, it's something you can hand off to someone else. So just making a list of ideas in your head is not a deliverable because you can't give it to someone else. It's a deliverable when you turn it into something you can hand over to someone else. The work that we do to make deliverables is broken up into tasks. And this sounds pretty stupid, right? Everybody knows what a task is. But let me ask you this. How many times has someone asked you to perform a task and then you do it and then they tell you you didn't do it right? In other words, everybody, you know, someone thinks it's obvious what you're being asked to do, but it isn't really. So we have to have really well-defined tasks if we want to have well-made deliverables. One of the challenges in project management is being able to define the tasks you're asking someone to do. So a good way of approaching it is really simple. I, I like to always start with a verb. In other words, what is the, the specific kind of work you're asking someone to do? Are you asking them to write something? Are you asking them to research something? Are you asking them to design something, to program something? 
Then you have to specify the deliverable. In other words, what are you expecting them to give you? If you're asking someone to design a character, for example, are you telling them that you want them to draw just a sketch on a piece of paper and stick it in your mailbox? Are you asking them to, to design that character inside of a tool like Adobe Illustrator and send it to you as a specific kind of file? What's involved? Then we have to estimate the effort. In other words, you've probably been in the situation where someone gives you a task to do and you spend like 20 hours on this piece of work and then they say, oh my God, why did you waste all that time? I, didn't, I only expected you to spend an hour on it. So it's important with a well-defined task to give some kind of estimate of the effort expected. We also have to identify the resources. In, either, in other words, what kinds of things do they need in order to accomplish the task and identify the inputs. So for example, if you tell someone, I want you to go design a character, um, presumably you want it to be based on something. So you might say, I want you to design a character that you're going to deliver to me in an Adobe Illustrator file. shouldn't take you more than five hours. You're going to need to use one of the computers with an Illustrator on it. And you're going to need the character description from the first draft of the script. So go get the script first so that you can get it. That's how we make a well-defined task. So, so far, what have we talked about? We've talked about process groups, knowledge areas, project life cycles, deliverables, and tasks. So it's important to quickly note one thing. Process groups are not phases. It'd be easy to think that they were, because if you think about it, they look the same. So process groups, you have initiating, planning, execution, control, and closing. That almost sounds like a life cycle. If you think of a movie life cycle, pre-production, well, that could be kind of like initiating, and production, that could be kind of like planning and execution, and post-production, um, that can be kind of also fitting into execution and control, and then closing could be kind of like distribution. But they're not the same. You shouldn't think of process groups that way. Process groups don't fit that way. Let me show you how they do fit into it. Phases are about the activities that happen during the same time period. Process groups are types of activities that we apply whenever we need them. In other words, you can initiate any different phase of a project. So for example, let's say we had three phases in a project, the discovery phase, the design phase, and the build phase. Well, we might go through the whole discovery phase and then actually have to initiate and plan the design phase and then have to initiate and plan the build phase. So that's how these things relate. So the process groups can be happening at any time uh, inside of any given phase of the project. So production management is about knowing the life cycle of a particular medium, such as film, web development, or print. It's about knowing how to make the thing. Production management is about knowing how you make a certain thing. Project management is about the universal management principles that help you achieve the project goals and objectives. It's not about how to make the thing, it's about how to make the thing successful. So, those are the key areas. So what we have to do is just quickly review this. So look over your infographic. Ask yourself, do I know what a project is, right? Think about a unique temporary endeavor. Do you have a way of thinking and explaining what project management is? Do you know what project managers are supposed to know and be able to do? Do you know what the process groups are? There's five of them. Do you know what the knowledge areas are? There's nine of them. Do you know what a project life cycle is? Do you know what the difference between a phase and a deliverable is? For example, a phase is a period of time during which related activities take place. A deliverable is a tangible result of work. So what are stakeholders? Do you remember what kinds of people stakeholders are? Do you remember what the difference between a goal and an objective is? If you can do all that, well, congratulations, because that is the core body of knowledge that you need as a starting point in, the, in order to be able to learn all the other parts of project management. If you can understand those concepts, then you're ready to start learning about things like how to do project selection, how to write project charters, how to create project plans. All these other things are based on that framework. So hopefully you've got something out of this and good luck.